Hi everyone, my name is Kieran and I am an NBE certified echo enthusiast. On today's screencast, we will explore the differential diagnosis behind an abnormal VTI. I recommend that you watch my previous screencast about how to calculate VTI, stroke volume, and cardiac output so that you can better follow along through today's video. Let's get started. The first question to always ask yourself is whether your patient is in shock. This is critical as shock is a clinical diagnosis and echo hemodynamics should be used to help you figure out why your patient is in shock. Remember that shock is defined as impaired end organ perfusion, and patients can have a normal blood pressure but still have shock. If your patient is not in shock, then it doesn't really matter what your VTI, stroke volume, or cardiac output is because they are meeting their perfusion goals. If your patient is in shock, however, you need the following approach. Recall that a normal VTI is between 18 to 22. Thus, we define a low VTI as less than 18 and a high VTI as more than 22. However, you may come across slightly different numbers in the literature. Some texts define normal as between 16 to 20, while others use 18 as an absolute cutoff. Whatever numbers you decide to use, it is important to correlate the value to the clinical picture. For instance, if after resuscitation, your patient has a normal mental status, normal lactate, is producing urine, and has a normal capillary refill, but their VTI is 16, you should think twice before acting on this. Their clinical picture is not consistent with shock, and initiating interventions to push their VTI up to 18 is unlikely to provide benefit and may instead cause harm. Another important concept to understand is that the trend of your VTI value is just as important as the absolute number. The absolute number will give you a hypothesis on why your patient is in shock, but you should test out this hypothesis by implementing an intervention. For instance, say my patient has a low VTI of 13, and I suspect it is due to a failing left ventricle. After initiating inotropes, if the VTI improves or even normalizes, then my diagnosis of cardiogenic shock was correct. With these concepts in mind, let's break down the causes of a low versus high VTI. Remember that VTI is a surrogate for stroke volume and cardiac output. Thus, using the traditional approach of distinguishing between types of shock, low VTI can be caused by obstructive, cardiogenic, or hypovolemic shock. Distributive shock can also lead to a low VTI, but this is less commonly seen. On the other hand, distributive shock is a primary cause of a high VTI. Rather than memorizing this, however, I find it easier to understand the mechanisms behind an abnormal VTI. A low VTI can be due to two things. A, there's not enough blood getting out of the LV, or B, the LV is not able to pump out enough blood through the aortic valve. On the other hand, a high VTI is because the LV is pumping out too much blood. Let's first talk about high VTI because it is the easiest to understand. Recall that preload, afterload, and contractility are the primary determinants of stroke volume. For a high stroke volume, you either need high contractility, high LV preload, or low LV afterload. However, of these three, the only thing that would lead to shock is a low LV afterload. Thus, causes of shock with a high VTI include disease processes that lead to vasoplegia and low afterload. Vasodilatory septic shock is one of the most common reasons for admission to the ICU. Anaphylaxis and acute liver failure also lead to vasoplegia. Finally, anything that leads to a SERS response, such as pancreatitis, post-MI, post-massive transfusion, and burns lead to shock with a high VTI. One of the causes of a low VTI is due to a low LV preload. This can be broken down into two causes. A, there is not enough blood in the body, which is akin to hypovolemic shock, or B, there is enough blood, but it cannot get to the left heart. This is akin to obstructive shock. Causes of hypovolemia include bleeding, GI losses, and insensible losses. On the other hand, causes of obstructive shock include tamponade, RV failure, which would include a massive PE, tension pneumothorax, and abdominal compartment syndrome. The one cause that fits under distributive shock, but is still due to an inability for blood to enter the heart, is a low mean circulatory filling pressure. In distributive shock, blood can pool in the extremities, leading to a low stress volume. In patients who require higher filling pressures to fill their heart, such as those with diastolic dysfunction, this low filling pressure can result in inadequate venous return to the heart. This presents as a low VTI, and the treatment for this is correcting the vasoplegia through vasopressors rather than administering fluid. Finally, 
The last cause of a low BTI is the inability of the LV to pump blood out through the aortic valve. These can be broken down into pump issues or valve issues. Any condition that impairs LV systolic function falls under pump issues. These include an MI, septic cardiomyopathy, stress cardiomyopathy such as Takotsubo's, and myocarditis. Worsening cardiac function in the context of previous heart failure also leads to a low VTI. Severe MR causes a low VTI as during systole, blood travels backward into the left atrium rather than leaving through the aortic valve. Now the effect of severe AI is important to understand as it leads to an overestimation of the true VTI. While in systole, you may measure a VTI of 18. However, in diastole, some of that blood refluxes into the LV. Thus, the end organs such as the brain, kidney, and liver only see a VTI of say 15. Therefore, a patient with moderate to severe AI should have a VTI above 22 at baseline. A VTI of 18 is inappropriately normal in these patients. There you have it. I hope this has provided you with an approach to diagnose the cause of your patient's shock by using the VTI. Some key take-home points. Always remember to keep the clinical picture in mind. Assess whether your patient is in shock, and if so, is the VTI consistent with the clinical context? Remember what the caveats are to acquiring and interpreting your VTI. This was not covered in today's video, and I refer you to Western Sano's excellent screencast on this topic. Always have a structured approach to assessing the cause of an abnormal VTI using the above framework. Finally, remember to trend your VTI after interventions. This helps you determine if your diagnosis was correct and to assess your response to therapies. Thank you for listening and see you again.